some scraps from Harry. I can't speak to the entire time. I've been doing that all day. Uh, Harry's collection. Um, if only Harry, luckily Harry didn't use the, didn't take them on the airplane with him and uh, leave them in the gate. I shipped them to you like two weeks ago. Yes. See, shipping me things is a good thing. <laughs> and only shipping me your computer, that would be fine. In case anybody sees Harry's computer in LA. No, we're in Boston. In Boston. In Boston. <coughs> Or how was the security in Boston? Excuse me, the topic. It's just as bad as it was on 9 11, 2001. But, uh, and we're here joined with, a, with us as a guest, uh, Mr. Dr. Richard Humor. Right, thank you. Hey. Hey. Did you, uh, by the way, it's, uh, I don't know if people have seen this on the SQL website, but is that your house? That those walls that we recently yes, saved. Yes. That was your. Did you grow up in those rooms? Yes, I did. That was your. His, his father painted pictures of Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck beautifully on these on these walls. And so the years have gone by. The house is sold, and then they were going to destroy the house. And luckily, we were able to. I was really condensed in this. Quite a quite a story. Well, it's good to tell the story now because I would, I thought if we had some time, I'd uh, get into a little more like the what it was like to grow up in that house and, and with the. Winkler's uh, living next door, as oh, we know. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Charles Mintz is the. Uh, look at it, all those relationships. Charles Mintz and Mintz and Winkler. So. Interesting. Okay. Um, Harry, why do we like Scrappy so much? Exactly, <laughs> 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 by now. Uh, I think that. Uh, I'm amazed that there are as many people here as there are because when I launched the website, I wasn't sure that. Anybody except for a few people like me and Jerry and David Gerstein cared. And I've actually found that um, he seems to have some appeal even to people who don't know about him. And the fact he's so obscure actually is sort of interesting. I think it's kind of unusual that he was around for 10 years. There was an enormous amount of merchandise. I mean, he was not a flash in the pan back then, but then sort of when you go out in the real world, I defy anybody to find any sort of normal person who, who has any memory whatsoever. Of Scrappy, and I find that to be intriguing. I also find him to be just sort of really, uh, he is a 1930s cartoon character in a way that's interesting. The whole style I think is very appealing. I think it's your father's style, even when uh, he left the series, he just sort of tried to do it in the same style. Uh, the themes of the cartoons and stuff on Prohibition and flop houses. Uh, almost every Scrappy cartoon is clearly something from the 1930s. Right. Um, that's a lot of it. Well, I'm, some, not all of the cartoons are great. I've never claimed that every scrappy cartoon is a great cartoon. But I think the best ones remain entertaining and funny. Right. Uh, it's not like a lot of stuff in the 30s where um, the only thing that's appealing about it is that it's kind of archaic. They actually are. The best ones are good cartoons. We were talking to somebody um, just a moment ago about the fact that we had two cartoons that we're, that we're going to be seeing later. And we may know about them already. But the, uh, we're not on the TV package, and they're the only two that have the original titles on them that we see, and um, not counting the color cartoons. And the, uh, they're both about, one, <coughs> one's, one's pre the end of pro Prohibition, it's all about you know, drinking and liquor, and the other one's beer. The other one's celebrating the end of Prohibition, and it's you know, beer drinking. I, I was, I'm sorry, I said Jerry Gould and I, we were saying that I uh, can't think of any other studio. How many other, besides Buddy's Beer Garden, how many other Beer cartoons that you think of. And I wonder if it's a 1940. Which one? Katniss in 1940. It has a big bear sequence in it. He, uh, uh, I, 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 I remember the, the famous line that Chuck said about uh, Edward Silzer about uh, he, he caught the guys laughing and he's like, what's all this laughing got to do with making animated cartoons? <laughs> and I keep thinking that, that probably at the Mint Studio, they probably walk in, what's all this beer drinking got to do with making an animated cartoon? Remember the end of Bosco in person? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Big 3 2 beer with Roosevelt's picture on the yeah. sign. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice Roosevelt. Uh, yeah. Lady Lynn has a lot of beer, didn't you? Mr. Magoo sold beer in the 50s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dang. Okay, let's go back to this topic. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, so tell us about your father. Tell us about, well, and if you can, let's let us, let, yes, in the beginning, at least, let's concentrate on the Columbia era. That's, what happened? Did you guys move out from, I mean, you were, when were you? I was, I was in the America. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we don't want to hear that introductory stuff here. 
Why don't you start? Well, oh, I have the title of my talk. It's uh, oh, it's talk. Scrap this is talk. Scrappy, semiotics and the Faustian myth and epistemic synthesis. <laughs> 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 speakers who came all the way from Austria, Dr. Uh, Dr. Graf, uh, let it slip that when he was a boy he wanted to become a, a man who made animated cartoons. And that's why I was delighted. I gave him my card uh, and uh, said I wanted to correspond with him by email so that um, I'd, like to, I'd like to get a psychiatric perspective on <laughs> the differences between you know, psychiatry and animated cartoons. Um, I might get, get to use that title. But at any rate, um, we came back from Santa Fe, which is where the conference was. We made a wrong turn in Albuquerque, but uh, we're here. Uh, my father created a number of characters. Uh, one of them was based on our experience in the Southwest, right after World War II. We all went traveling to New Mexico and Arizona, which is where he got this beautiful bullet tie, which I'm wearing today. It's also where he got the idea for one of his characters, uh, the cowboy, Buck Roo. And if you don't know Buck Roo, don't worry. Uh, we're, he's going to become more popular after we get a little book put together. A Swedish comics fan and I are working on that right now, scanning some, uh, some proofs in, into the computer. But uh, uh, among his characters were, were four boys. Uh, three of them were flesh and blood boys, my, myself, my brother David, my brother Alan, but one of them, uh, who was the older brother, was uh, Scrappy. That was his first son. And he rather, I think, rejected Scrappy. He didn't, uh, he didn't love the character the way he loved us. But, oh goodness, somebody is also with very, very little to go on. He had no brothers in his family. He grew up with uh, three sisters. And uh, interesting sisters. One, one died young. Uh, one uh, became a writer of mystery stories. And one, who was a Christian scientist, lived to the age of 92. And I attribute her longevity to the fact that she never saw a doctor. I'm a doctor. I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen he grew up in the neighborhood of Brooklyn, uh, where there were a number of uh, mixed uh, German and Jewish neighborhood. Uh, my father actually was quite fluent in Yiddish. He used to speak it all the time uh, with his friend George Winkler, perhaps so that the children would know what they were talking about. Uh, uh, I was also told by a family friend that he had, uh, as a, as a, to pick up some extra money, as a, as, as a youth, he worked as a Shabbos boy. So somebody who was a gopher on the Sabbath. Um, I, I didn't know that until a friend told us. Um, at any rate, I grew up in a house in North Hollywood, California, in an area now called Valley Village. At the time I was a kid, Valley Village merely referred to the corner of Laurel Canyon and Magnolia Boulevard. Now it's a much wider area. Uh, in a house that was built in 1935 by the architect who designed the original buildings in Westwood Village. The, uh, our neighbors, next door neighbors, were George and Lillian Winkler. And uh, the Winklers are very importantly involved with the cartoon industry. Not so much George, uh, although anybody who uh, knows anything about Disney knows that uh, Disney was rather badly screwed over by George and, and his sister uh, Margaret and uh, with regard to the Oswald the Rock Rabbit character. I suppose you all know that story. Mm -hmm. That's Disney. Um, some, somehow, uh, at the end of the 1920s and the beginning of the 30s, my father was enticed to the West Coast, uh, probably uh, by the Winklers, to uh, work uh, in the cartoon industry here. Prior to that, he worked for uh, Max Fleischer, he worked for his own company, Associated Animators, which he formed with some others. He worked for uh, Raoul Barre, did I say that right, Ray? Close enough, okay. Ah, Raoul. Raoul Barre, okay. 
Um, we're sensitive to pronunciation because humor has been pronounced all different kinds of ways. Uh, I've been called Hummer and Hoimer and whatever, but uh, when I went to Austria last summer, a man named Tony Hummer told me it is in fact pronounced Hummer in Austria. And it means in kind of a, a take your pick, a subsistence farmer or perhaps a cowboy. Like cowboy bag. Um, at any rate, uh, George Winkler's sister was Margaret Winkler, the cartoon distributor. I understand that she made a deal back in the uh, before 1920s, uh, or, or was uh, or, uh, somehow talked herself into a position as a distributor of cartoons due to contacts at uh, Paramount, uh, Paramount in New York. And uh, as far as I know, they were the biggest game in town. Um, she had a salesman uh, named Charles Mintz, and. Uh, Again, according to my source, uh, uh, he married the boss. He married Margaret. Who I did not know was Margaret. I knew her as Peggy. And I uh, didn't understand that Peggy Mintz was uh, George Winkler's sister or any, anything about that when I was a kid. But I knew that the Mintzes were somehow special. Whenever the Mintzes would come over, uh, they, the Winkers would get all of the tizzy and bring out their finest. Um, it got so that everything associated with mints uh, seemed special to me. I remember one time Lillian Winkler baked a uh, mince pie, and I <laughs> <laughs> was disappointed when the minces didn't show up to eat it. But I knew it was special because we kids were not allowed to have any of it. Um, the uh, mints family uh, had two children, Billy and Kiki. Uh, Billy had a set of drums when he was a teenager. He wanted to form an orchestra. And uh, I looked him up, I Googled Billy Mintz, and there is a drummer on the East Coast named Billy Mintz, but he's the wrong age. He's an offspring of all parts. After a while, George Winkler improbably, uh, improbably enough, went into agriculture. He was on an egg ranch, managed an egg ranch, and then he uh, owned an orange grove. But I think he served as stint as uh, head of the Street Jump Studio right, right before his uh, departure from the cartoon industry. I, I gather he wasn't very good at that. That would, would have been after Charles Mintz died. Um, we followed him into the Orange Grove business, uh, much to our chagrin. Uh, George's friend, uh, the producer Henry Blaney, bailed him out of it when, it, uh, when the uh, Orange Grove industry turned sour. Uh, in the uh, late 1940s, but we had to bite the bullet on that ourselves. Uh, the Winters uh, briefly lived in our house for about a year. Uh, Lillian was a marvelous cook. Uh, poor Lillian, who was a, a, a woman, a, with a very motherly woman with uh, dancing black eyes, uh, a lot of spirit, but I think as an adult now I realize she wasn't happy with her life. She died of uh, breast cancer rather hardly. George remarried after a while and uh, went into yet another business. I, I never did, you know, as a kid, I didn't know what kind of work our neighbor George Winkler did. I asked my father, but my parents always gave me sophisticated answers to questions, uh, so I, I never really quite understood. For instance, the question to what does George Winkler do for a living, my father replied, he is a professional relative. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this stood him in good stead uh, when he had some relatives who uh, uh, wanted to uh, open a salvage outlet in Southern California. So for his last year, George, who remarried, uh, ran, uh, managed a store called Green's Bargain Store on Magnolia Boulevard in Hollywood. And that's where he taught me about merchandising. I said, gee, George, you get these little dented cans uh, from the shipping companies for only pennies? I, you could sell them real cheap and, and uh, help a lot of people. I said, no, 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 said George. You sell them for just a few cents under the market. Then people know they're getting a bargain and they'll come and buy them. If you sell them too cheap, they'll think they're junk and they won't buy any. Um, I, I want to say right here now, because we have to get on with the show pretty soon, I don't want to let Harry talk, uh, that uh, right here now that uh, George Winkler did not invent uh, the Polaroid camera. It is true, he, is a very t he was a very talented photographer. He took uh, many, many fine pictures of us when we were kids. Uh, but I know, he, uh, I know he didn't invent the Polaroid camera because I was there. He, um, he uh, 
told us when we asked why do we have to go through all that rigmarole of photography, as he explained how it was done, uh, why couldn't the picture just come out of the camera? He said that was impossible, impossible according to the rules of, sci of photography and the laws of science. So uh, when we were visiting the Grand Canyon on that trip I mentioned, uh, after World War II when we went to the Southwest, my brother and I met a little girl and uh, we took a picture. She said, hey, when can I see the picture? So oh, it's going to take a long time you know, to develop it. She said, oh, I think I'm going to ask my daddy if he can make a camera that does that. You can't ask your daddy to do that. Nobody can do it. It's impossible. <laughs> the little girl came back and said, my daddy says he can make a camera that does that. He's very smart. He can do anything. Well, we have edge to wait for her. We figured that daddy was lying to her. Many years later, I read an interview in which Edward, Edward Land said the very best idea he ever had, he got from his daughter when they were visiting the Grand Canyon. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> had you been for George's negativity, I think uh, it might never have come about. Um, Anyway, the Winkler's house uh, was sold to Mel Shabelson, the producer, and then to the Ryder family, who still lives there. Uh, my mother uh, lived in the house in North Hollywood from 1935 to uh, 1999, when she died, about 20 years uh, short one day, one day my father died. And um, we sold the, uh, but she created an island, an oasis in the midst of uh, uh, what I came to regard as urban chaos. Like you. you know, you, you, have to, you have to cue me like a, like when I say semiotics, you can you do this? Okay. You want to hurry up, you do this. Don't do this. Okay. That's, that's not true. Don't hurry up. Okay. Um, and you know, it was very quiet and still in the house. It was, my time had stopped there. I wrote to my daughter. I said, I said late at night, you can be in the old house and it's very still. You can still have a trolley car running down the boulevard. Um, but the, uh, the house's doom was sealed in 1935. That's when my uh, parents acquired a strip of property from the Winklers. They, they needed the strip of property to my parents, making the frontage of the lot 150 feet. After, uh, uh, after uh, some nice people, the Grahams, a screenwriter, screen you know, uh, bought the house, somehow a developer acquired it. Uh, tore down the old house, which is no longer, and uh, is putting up three two-story houses where it once stood. Uh, a secret to the rescue, I notified Jerry Beck, and, uh, and uh, I guess you put me in contact with him. Larry. Well, from Kelly Lock is one of the major heroes. Oh, well, one of the major heroes. Thank you so much, Larry. Yeah. All you do is call some people up and say, hey, come out and put it on the truck. Well, my brother and I have uh, contributed matching funds for restoring that mural and the see is to raise the rest of them. Part of this is going to be done with a humoresque show. If any of you are going to be around on June 9th, which is not a weekend, it's uh, the Thursday, there's going to be a humoresque show of uh, a Dick Humor re retrospective dating from the, the uh, Raoul Barry days uh, through the Fleischer days, the Associated Animators, the Mints, uh, all the stuff he did with uh, Disney's both as an animator, as a story man, and as a director. And uh, this is very, very nice uh, one hour program has been uh, put together. I haven't seen it yet uh, by our, our dear friend uh, Ray Pointer, who's in the girl. And uh, maybe you guys want to talk more about that. But I want to put everybody here on notice if you like. Hopefully, you will like Scrappy, otherwise. <laughs> If you're going to come to the other thing or not, but <laughs> what the hell? It's called humoresque, and uh, uh, with that, I think uh, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do this. And uh, thank you all for inviting me. I really enjoyed being here. Um. Uh, yeah, actually, um, Harry asked me about that, and um, he, uh, my father, explained it to me um, that uh, people have always had trouble spelling our name. Not only pronouncing it, mind you, I told you we had hummers and hummers and all that kind of stuff, but spelling it. And uh, being an accommodating guy, basically a nice guy, uh, he decided to make it easy for people to spell. So he tried H-E-U-M-E-R. We have a couple of things on the side that way. We have H-E-U-M-O-R. And we probably have H-U-E-M-O-R, too.
too. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't just just do HU and MOR. I don't know. Perhaps it wasn't dignified. But, uh, I'm not sure that would bother him <laughs> terribly. Uh, Is there uh, any? Um, I'm sorry. That's no, just fine. The, uh, do you have any, any recollection of him saying anything about Toby Pup? No, he was pretty dismissive about Scrappy. And, uh, <laughs> Toby was But I found, uh, yeah, um, Mike Barrier uh, thinks that uh, he was unfairly dismissive about Scrappy. Mike uh, <coughs> likes the Scrappies, and uh, I hope you all will too. From the couple I've seen, I think they're amusing. But I did run across a trove of newspaper clippings. They were uh, like they would have been from an um, in-house publication from uh, from Columbia, uh, reviewing the latest Toby the Pup cartoons, and uh, of course giving a great review, which is why I suspect it was an in-house publication. I might, uh, <laughs> I might dump those in your lap sometime when you can uh, do something. You may need to start a Toby website. Oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to ask you a question that uh, you were up. I used to visit your dad uh, back in the 70s when uh, he and Holly were in that house. And I ran him a bunch of scrappies in 16 millimeter. He enjoyed seeing them. And he sang the theme song for me. It had no, lyrics. Oh. And I wondered if he ever sang it to you or if they were ever written down. I wish I'd written them at the time. I didn't have the presence of mind to do it, unfortunately. I was kind of awestruck and just listening, you know? But that it did have lyrics. I and didn't know that. I, I don't know if that's ever surfaced in anything you found. It hasn't. But you know, if you tell me about something, I can recognize it when I see it. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Sure. Any questions from here? The, um, we're gonna. Well, one reason we did this event is because our, our good friend Michael Schlesinger was sitting over there on the side. And, uh, and by the way, too, and Jerry Gould was part of our CIFA preservation. They wanted us to be the prince for today's show. And, uh, thanks to David Gerstein, who, uh, <laughs> who uh, spotted something on the internet about uh, House of Restorations. We found out that, that uh, Columbia, unknown to almost everybody, including Columbia, including Columbia <laughs> that they, they restored a bunch of the uh, black and white cartoons from the 30s. So uh, we've been bugging them out to see if they really did. And, I said, gee, what do they do? You know, people always say, well, they put it on DVD? Oh, no, no thoughts of that. So, <laughs> Why not? We should at least one of them for ourselves or something. So that's what this is all about. So, so we, thank, we thank our fellow people.
So you've seen it? I haven't seen it. I wanted to. Oh, yeah, but I, uh, did you work on the one with the um, um, Darwin too? Because I know that uh, Fletcher mm -hmm. did a Darwin one. He never mentioned that. Mm -hmm. I, I suspect, but uh, I'm not 100 percent sure that they did a, um, a stag one too. <laughs> 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 Uh, it was been a fun place to work. Um, the, uh, I guess the old building still stands in New York. Uh, it's just being uh, remodeled. So now we have one Broadway, near Broadway and 42nd, somewhere in there. It was recently in the neck of the museum. Being tucked down. Yes. Yeah. 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 There might have been about 20 miles down the road. Yeah. 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 The student vehicle. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. Between 47 and 48, and Broadway and Sun. We thought about working on like, the swing songs and the bouncing ball. No, but he did work on the bouncing ball part. He did, uh, I think one of the very early ones was Old Mabel. I know he worked on that one. And uh, uh, he also worked on some of the later ones. You can kind of tell by the animation style uh, which ones he did, which ones he did. Uh, Ray Pointer has a whole uh, disc of those uh, song cartoons, a DVD, and uh, it's interesting to see the, the variations in the animation styles. Yeah. How long was he with Disney? Uh, he, uh, I think I saw a contract uh, dated 1933. I know that I know he has the original employment con uh, contract in the papers. I'm pretty sure it was around 1933, uh, and then. Uh, he retired in 1971, is my recollection. Um, and we'll have his retirement picture uh, on, on the June 9th thing. All of his friends at Disney's uh, uh, signed it. Uh, somebody, somebody sketched him in retirement. It looks like Floyd Godfrey's work to me. It's a big color sketch, and it's framed with a green mat. And all of the animators and artists and other people at Disney's that he knew signed it. Of it. So I'll have a reproduction of that uh, on this um, point. But there was a hiatus. Uh, you might have heard that uh, my father and Joe Grant were collaborators, uh, and uh, they um, were very active during the war years. Disney, uh, Disney flew them to Washington, D.C., and uh, took them on uh, another trip uh, working for the war work. Uh, they were Grant and you were referred to as Disney's top writers, or simply as Disney's writers. Um, and around uh, 1948, I think it was, uh, things turned sour. Uh, not that they weren't both dissatisfied with the Disney organization, but Disney got pretty dissatisfied with them. And uh, I'm not sure which one he wanted to fire the most, but since they were a set, both of them. Uh, so uh, he was, my father was not in Disney's again until 1953, I think it was. 50, maybe it was 52. It was the, um, yeah, it was 52. Because he was doing the Buck Over Comics strip, uh, trying to feed his family and keep me in college. And um, Disney rehired him. Comic strip Too bad, it was funny as hell. Stay in touch with people like Sid Marcus and Mark Davis and people from those scrappy days. Uh, did he? Yeah. I uh, don't recall that he did. I think he had a whole new set of friends in Disney's. <laughs> he left those Clash of Columbia people down and down. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that wonderful photograph which many of you, I'm sure, have seen the Inkwell reunion. Everybody sitting around the table. Mm -hmm. If you haven't, I'll put that on the poster for too. So we might find this stuff we were packing the house up. Well, uh, let's plug that one more time. It's uh, Wednesday, June 9th. When is that event? June, June 9th. 9th. June 9th. It's a Thursday or something? Yes. Good. And we're at Central, Central Library. The Glendale uh, Central Library. So we uh, get the whole big picture of the day from the movie. Whereas today we're going to just focus on the other And. Uh,
I'm going to say we'll stop right now so people can get one more look at the merchandise and then go get their favorite seat in our little theater. <laughs> and we'll get all set up and uh, have fun from that. Okay. Is retired, you know. It's it's got like the little Mickey Mouse ears, and it's like no longer to be sold. It's I guess it's racist or something. So anyway, <laughs> uh, no wait a minute. Didn't uh, uh, Gert David or uh, uh, who worked on? Uh, I mean, uh, Dick Humor wrote like the comics, didn't he, for Song of the South? Or um, I mean, the comics? No, the, he, he wrote, wrote a, he wrote a couple of them. He did. He wrote a couple. Yeah, I, I have the proof. Okay, well at least there's some connection. Thank yeah. you. Sure. We'll see Margie in one of the cartoons today. She was in very few of the scrappy cartoons, but she's in uh, the one called Showing Off. So we're going to see uh, a whole bunch of cartoons. In fact, there's an, we gave out this list, and we realized there was an extra one in the box, so one that we didn't list, so we're going to show that one too. In fact, it's, um, it's Dog Snatcher, and it's, uh, I think it's going to be shown second because I'm trying to show them in chronological order, and I believe, without looking, that the first, second, and third cartoon we're going to run are the something like the third, fourth, and fifth scrappies. Uh, the cartoons today were chosen not only as a little mini tribute to Dick Humor, but because these I, we chose the, the earliest ones that were available uh, from Columbia Pictures. And we want to once again thank Michael Schlesinger of Columbia Pictures. So and we also want to thank um, Jerry Goulden, who's here someplace in the back, who uh, provided us with a special film that you'll see later in the program, uh, Scrappy's Puppet Theater, which is a uh, special promotional trailer, uh, which we've run here before, actually, but, but if you haven't seen it. It's, it's good for a laugh. Jerry has it run every other week. I run it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why would you see it. That's my name. And, um, also, um, and the last two films tonight are also uh, are later, are uh, uh, two of the, I think, four? Four color appearances of Scrappy in color Rhapsody cartoons later on in the uh, 30s. So we uh, thought we'd end with a, you know, some brilliant color because also these are restoration prints as well and they look really great. And um, the, when these cartoons were sold to the, uh, the TV in the 50s, they went out under this Samba Pictures label um, and uh, so uh, Columbia or somebody, they snipped off the original uh, titles on the negatives and they replaced them with this, these TV titles. So most of them have these Samba picture titles, but if you're a collector of the cartoons, you've never seen the t Samba titles look so good. They look great <laughs> in 35. You can even see the little slots for the names. It's really kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but we have a couple that have never, were not in the TV package. Thank you. They're both uh, beer related or liquor related, Ooh. and uh, so I think uh, we've got a kick out of those. Have the original titles on them, and as do the color rhapsodies at the end. Anyway, Scrappy, as you've never seen them before, so I can get the projectionist attention. Oh, we have one question. I, I just want to say that uh, Edith Fellows uh, oh. was a child star in the '30s and spent a day posing with uh, Scrappy in the '30s, posing with all the Snappy or Scrappy product, and uh, wanted to be here today, but. Uh, you know, but her her granddaughter is graduating today, so sends her best wishes, and just want just to let everyone know that the Three Stooges joined her for part of the day on that photo session. Oh, really? Some of those photos. And the Three Stooges. Yeah. Uh, and and that she never got any of the toys. 
So. <laughs> they never give me any. Uh, also, it reminds me, uh, and this is maybe a good, a, a, a wonderful way to celebrate him, but uh, we, we invited uh, a guest of ours who was going to be here, who was here for our UPA show uh, last year, uh, Ed Friedman, who was an animator, started on the Scrappy cartoons, and he just passed away, I think, yesterday or the day before, so uh, he knew about this program and, and uh, was, well, he wasn't in good shape, but, you know, hope he could be here. So this will be a tribute to him too. Okay, here we go.